Aaron Daniels from the Healthy Creative Podcast shares his passion for creativity with you. If you're looking for interesting creative and design conversations, or just simple and effective ways to get more creativity into your life, then this show is for you. Aaron and his guests deliver simple, effective advice that promotes inclusion into creativity rather than unnecessary exclusion. Creativity isn't just for creative types. The result? A sharper, smarter, more creative you. Now it's time to join your host, Aaron Daniels, for the Healthy Creative Podcast. Hi folks, and welcome to the final episode of Series 1 of the Healthy Creative Podcast, brought to you by healthycreative.co.uk. I'm Aaron Daniels. I work in London's world-class creative industry. I work in design and art direction but I've got a serious appetite for all things creative. I'm joined today by a design legend. From state-of-the-art exotic supercars to daily drivers, sketched and brought to life visions for Ford, BMW, Mini, Ferrari, Maserati, Fiat and McLaren. His passion and ability to push the limits means his design thinking and work extend beyond the automotive sphere. So we've got even more to talk about today. The future of transport nature and design, and the holy grail, perfection. We're going to cover a lot of really cool stuff, so this episode is broken into two parts. This is part one. I'm excited to welcome Frank Stephenson to the show. How are you, sir? Very well, Aaron. Thank you. How would you describe yourself? Probably, in general terms, a cosmopolitan. I've been brought up in many different countries from birth to today. I probably not spent more than 10 years in one place. It pretty much brings a lot of different international influences into my psyche, into my character. People tend to think that I'm American simply because of my accent, but it couldn't be farther from the truth. I've spent very little time in the U.S. and basically I've traveled since very young. I am pretty much the distillation, I guess you could say, between a Scandinavian father, Andalusian mother, southern Spain. You know, that is pretty much the two extremes, a cold climate country, obviously, and warm climate country. But it's also the thinking. Scandinavians are typically known to be very cool, the way they do things, their styles, everything. The southern Europe, Latin culture is more uh, happy-go-lucky, sort of, you know, Mm -hmm. enjoy life, Mm -hmm. enjoy the moment, a lot of creativity put into both directions, but just very different at the same time. So that is what typically is a good mix, I would say, for design. What was it like growing up? Did you grow up around cars? No, no, I didn't grow up around cars at all. I grew up around uh, camels and donkeys more. (laughs) I was raised in the 60s in Casablanca, Morocco, and we had very few beautiful cars around us. I was more used to four-legged transportation for a long time, which I love. It's it's a complete different uh, lifestyle. I wouldn't say it's third world or anything like that, but it definitely isn't first world. That kind of upbringing grounds you quite a bit, I would say. You know, you're not used to the finer things in life, mm-hmm. but you don't need the finer things in life. I think it's the the smells and the sounds, the colors, everything that you see. You probably see those more intensely in these mm-hmm. types of living environments. Mm-hmm. I've got to touch and feel and see things more than, you know, just read about them. What sparked your interest in automotive design in particular? I do remember the first time a car stopped me in my tracks. I was walking hand in hand with my father along Rue Mohammed V, pretty important boulevard in Casablanca, on March 19th, 1969 to be precise. And the reason why I remember it is because it was such a memorable (laughs) thing in my past. And there was a Jaguar E-Type Series 1 parked on the side of the road there. And again, I, I had no idea what I was looking at, but for me it was the most beautiful, inanimate sculpture I'd ever seen in my life. It stopped me in my tracks. I remember being aghast almost, you know, walking around it, touching it on my knees underneath, looking at the (laughs) bottom of the car. (laughs) And my father wasn't surprised because my father had always loved cars and I sort of had this thing in the back of my mind that cars were special. But I remember about probably 10 minutes had passed and um, I guess he, he was trying to get off to the next place we were going, but he said, okay, it's time to go. And I remember just breaking out in tears, saying, I'm not leaving, I want to stay here, silly as it sounds. I just did not want to uh, leave, and um, I think he almost had to drag me away. When I was 11, we moved to Istanbul, Mm -hmm. Turkey, and so I spent the next half of my education in an international school, and we moved then from Istanbul to Madrid, and in Madrid I did my last uh, year of high school. Mm -hmm. Did pretty well, but I had no interest in continuing my studies, but 
as you do when you finish school, you, you don't want to start working right away. And I just by serendipity had met a, a friend in school who was actually racing motorcycles in his free time. And I went with him to a couple races. And of course, the virus bit me and I had <laughs> to do the same thing. So I asked my father if I could race for a year. And he said, sure, get it out of your system. And then, uh, then we're going to get your, your tail to work. <laughs> and I raced uh, the first season. I managed to win the junior national title. Second year, I was moved up to the senior class, and I won the senior national title. So that allowed me to basically become professional, uh, mainly due to the fact that I'd been hired by a Japanese motorcycle company to be one of their professional Mm -hmm. riders and do the world circuit, world uh, championships. And my father was all for me doing that. You know, he was really happy that it was going very well. And I spent the next four years racing around the world in the the world championships and not doing too bad. I was top 10 each of those four years. But I remember I was 22, just past 22, and my father pulled me aside one day and said, okay, Frank, it's over now. Come work for me now or go off and study. And it hit me like a ton of bricks because it was my life. But I, I could understand slightly his point of view because he said, you've never won a race. You've done very well. Uh, you know, top 10 is nothing to sneeze at. But if you're not winning, um, then you're going to probably end up around 30 years old without any real satisfaction behind you. Uh, just a lot of broken bones and broken dreams, I guess. I just read a few months before that there was actually a university in Los Angeles. They had courses in automotive design. This college, Art Center College of Design, It's painful to speak about it in the sense that it feels like I'm speaking about a concentration camp when I refer to it Mm. because it is the hardest thing you could probably take on to get through a university. It's Mm. rated, at least in U.S. systems, as Mm. the most difficult college university to get through after four years because of the pace, the intensity of it all. But the school is limited, at least when I was there, to about a 1,000 students from around the world for all the courses together. So it's, it's a very small, intense university. I remember the first day of class that we had, and we were 30 students from all over the world sitting in this one class, knowing that uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, we were pretty lucky. And I remember the professor coming in, and he mentioned one of the first things he said to us was, So you're 30 students of an average of around 4,000 students. We take just under 1% of the applicants. And, of course, we all, you know, thought we were hot and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then he cut us all down to size when he says, but we've never had a class finish with more than 10 of you. And none of us were ready at that point to say, you know, well, it might happen to me. (laughs) All of us thought it'll be the other guy. At the end, we were only six that managed to get through it. And all six of us have done pretty well. But that's it's art center for you. You're pretty well prepared. You, you feel like when you go into the profession that professionally that you're basically slowing down because the, the pace at art center is just ah, so heavy, so fast that anything else in comparison is like slowing down. Mm. Did university, instead of creative approach to the projects you work on, or did you think about your own approach? Is there a holistic approach that you take to all the projects that you work on? No, at that stage when you're young and, and just learning to be able to draw something that exists in your mind. You're not so developed at that stage that you can actually think so holistically of the world of design. You're just trying to draw Mm -hmm. something that looks like a car or Mm -hmm. looks like an object that you can understand on paper and it's Mm -hmm. represented well. And as you evolve as a designer, professionally, you do start to develop your own style, Mm -hmm. like like any artist, Mm -hmm. basically. Doing something photorealistically has a lot to say for itself, Mm -hmm. but to do something with a unique character... Uh, an image that has its own language, basically, that is your language, identifiable to you as, as a work of art that you've done or a piece of design, that is much more challenging. So can you take us through the vehicle design process, from your sketch to the showroom? Generally, I'd say is roughly a five-year process, but that was up to a few years ago, I'd say, because of the advance of electronics and digital techniques have allowed us very quickly in the last years to shorten that down quite a bit. Say back before 2000, it would take us five years to Mm -hmm. develop a car from scratch to production. Japanese at those times were generally managing it in 36 months, three years. So anything less than three years was risky. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking nowadays at something that can take you between 18 and 36 months, uh, you can imagine how quick things turn over in the development studios Mm -hmm. and development centers of the uh, of the major OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, mm-hmm. basically the car companies. So what we do pretty much is we get a brief from marketing, for example, and the marketing brief will say we need a four-seater car 
that carries this amount of luggage and will be priced in this price range here and will target this type of customer. Already you're starting to think brand recognition. The car has to look like the brand that you're working with. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just rely on the logo or on the script or something to tell the customer mm -hmm. this is a BMW. Yeah. So there's a design language that you have to adhere to or respect. doesn't lock you in because that's the worst thing for designers to get locked in to make something look exactly like you expect it to look. Designers are paid to come up with new ideas that move the game on for the better, not just moving on, mm -hmm. but moving on for the better, with a respect to the past or a respect mm -hmm. to the traditional values of the company. With that brief in mind, the design team, along with the engineering team, who will pretty much, the engineering team will set up the engineering package of the car, which means they will tell you, how far it is between the front wheel and the rear wheel of mm -hmm. the car, how wide the car is and how tall the car is and how much boot space or trunk space we're going to need for that amount of luggage, where the engine is at, how much space you're going to need around the engine. That's all predefined for you. Yeah. It. So what they basically do is they set out what we call hard points. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine that sort of being like a person's skeleton, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to, uh, you're, you're given a skeleton pretty much in a human form, but we're speaking about cars. And what you're going to do is build a body around that skeleton. You're not allowed to move the skeleton inwards because you're going to start hitting the heart and the lungs and the organs and <laughs> yeah, all that. Yeah. But you can pull it out a little bit so oh, you okay. get more space. But we tend not to pull things away because it adds weight. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep things pretty tight, comfortable, so you don't want people inside the car to be too uncomfortable. But you might have to compromise a little bit for aerodynamics, you know, to get a faster rake on the windscreen or a, a more beautiful profile, mm -hmm. Whatever. So there are compromises along the way. But basically, with this engineering package and the marketing brief, but typically what I like to do is I call it, you know, people call it brainstorming, I call it brain squeezing. We'll sit down with a few designers that are tackling this project, and we'll just start to bounce ideas off of each other, you know, what direction sounds good. But what you try to do is each designer should come up with his individual idea of what the design should look like. So then what happens is we all go sort of into a, a design phase where we give our individual interpretation. So what you're doing is past that brain squeeze moment, you start to let the, the sparks fly in your brain. You know, what could it be like? And then that spark obviously has to be done in a 2D form. So you're sketching on a clean sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. We don't do computers at that stage. It takes too long to work on a computer mm -hmm. and you lose the human touch. Absolutely. So a lot of people say, oh, don't you guys use computers to design cars? No, we don't. The best designs are created by hand. And what you do is you just start letting your hand interpret what your brain is thinking. And it's almost one of these magical processes where people who watch designer work, it's very bizarre to watch it because it's almost as if the designer is not really even present while the sketch is happening. He's almost in the zone, you could say. And so what he's doing is just watching or observing the sketches appear on paper in front of him. It might sound silly because you think he's in deep thought, but if you're trained the proper way, basically it's almost a strange process where the brain is thinking on a different level than you are physically, and it's transferring those mm -hmm. synapses or brain sparks or whatever you want to call them. As an observer, you're just basically critiquing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not thinking about drawing lines when mm -hmm. I'm drawing lines. I'm just watching it's almost myself. a subconscious. Completely kind subconscious, of yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's as both athlete, athletes can also relate mm -hmm. to it in the sense that a lot of the things they do will seem easy for them, but for other people, it seems like I could never achieve that. Mm. But it's um, in the zone mm. process, mm. you know, you're flowing, mm. flowing mm. And very easily. In terms of the sketch, some say that there are three strokes of a pen, three key lines mm -hmm. that define a car on paper. Mm. How true is that? Uh, I'll tell you, it, it, it's true in the sense if you're designing something that is an excellent design. If you need 10 lines to, to show what you're drawing, mm. that is not a successful design. Mm -hmm. That is no way, there's no way that's going to be an iconic design. Mm. Iconic typically is because something is simple, beautiful, and hits the nail on the head mm. with one hit. Those iconic designs in our history that we've always deemed as iconic, typically three lines are enough to identify what you're looking at. Mm. If it needs more than that, you're starting to get into much more complication. It's, 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 it's complex mm. and it loses that essence of, of purity. So what happens after you do the 2D sketches on paper, which means you're drawing different mm -hmm. ideas, different themes on paper, you'll put those up on the board and through a design critique that you have within your own studio, 
a lot of the ideas will get eliminated and the best ones will stay up. So you're filtering always constantly down to the best ideas. And typically what you'll end up with is three designs that sort of come close to the nice target that we're trying to achieve. Uh, one might be kind of far off. The next one will be way far off. And the, and the third idea might be just bizarre. Mm -hmm. With those three concepts, typically what we will then do is build a scale model of each. So we'll work in clay and we'll have sculptors, you know, people who can build anything with clay, sculpt our designs into, say, a one-fifth scale model. And then we'll look at the three designs in a physical form. And then we'll go with the one that we think is the best one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't make a decision for just one. You might choose mm -hmm. two. In that case, when you go from that stage, you'll go to a full-size scale model out of clay. And you might have two sides. You might have mm -hmm. one side representing, uh, okay. so a half model yep. on one side yep. and half on the other side. And what that allows you to do is to get to a full-size representation of the design modeled in clay. And people think, why clay? Well, clay is a medium that we use in the automotive design profession simply because you can constantly change it. It's not fixed once you do mm -hmm. it like it would be, mm -hmm. for example, in stone or mm -hmm because you have to put on, take off, put on, take off clay. And it gets hard enough so that you can basically touch it. It doesn't mm -hmm. dent. We paint these models, so basically from 30 feet away, you'll think it's real. The purpose is to evaluate them aesthetically yeah. and, and with the engineering team. At any rate, you will end up with a clay model that is in full size mm -hmm. that satisfies all the requirements for the engineering team in terms of aerodynamics and ergonomics, because mm -hmm. we'll also model the interior. Mm -hmm. All of it's done, everything in clay. Mm -hmm. How do you consider the interior and the exterior in terms of an experience? They have to go to hand in hand. It's kind of like, I mean, you do see sometimes people with a, a body that doesn't really go with a personality, you know. Mm. But I think in terms of industrial design, it should do what it says on the tin. Otherwise, you're really pulling the wool over people's eyes. Mm. When we design an exterior, we also have to consider the interior at the same time such that they belong to each other. Otherwise, the, it just doesn't make sense. Like I said earlier, if you want to make sure that the brand language is spot on, you should be able to identify it without a logo. And that goes also for the interior. Mm. You know, the design language carries through. It's an amazing process, very artistic, and, and one of the most beautiful processes to watch in anything that's being mm. developed. You see it actually become real in front mm. of your eyes. Mm. And you're creating this beauty. You know, you're not always 100% satisfied. You're never 100% satisfied as you're creating it because it's constantly evolving. You always have a better idea. So even a small knob for the radio or for a, mm. a button or whatever can change many times over oh, until okay. you get the right shape and feel. Yeah. So after the clay model has been completed, what would you then do? So when we finish the clay model and it's been proven to be accepted by engineering and by those in power of saying, okay, this is the next model of car that we're going to bring out. Then it goes from the clay stage, the full-size clay stage, to a prototype phase where they take panels and measurements, everything off the clay to produce a what we call a hard uh, physical model as a prototype. So we'll have panels that are basically made out of fiberglass or carbon fiber or even sheet metal, that prototype will be taken through the various phases that need to be done to make it comply to crash regulations and endurance testing with materials and colors and things. Some cars are meant to be quiet and some are meant to be outrageously loud. From the sound of the engine to the sound of a door latch, sound design is a massive part. How do you work with that? Well, we have a department specifically for that called NVH, Noise mm -hmm vibration and harshness. And what they do is they tune every noise that you hear in the car from turning the knob to what the door latch sounds like when you activate it or the thump you get when you close the door or the noise that goes through the car into the cabin if you hit a bump. One of the most attractive things to the human is sound. We all love music, we love voices. Sound is, is just as important as sight or taste for many of us. And so they put a lot of effort into making sure that the sound of things on a vehicle are pleasant. If you start to hear screeching or unpleasant sounds, it can immediately turn you off. The emphasis is to put a sound on the vehicle that is attractive and suiting. Obviously, the, the sports cars are going to have this very potent, strong, masculine, wouldn't say aggressive, but 
respectful. You know, you don't walk up to mm. a, a lion when it's roaring. You, you stand back <laughs> and, and admire it. But the same thing. So uh, it, it's very easy. You could make any car sound, for example, like a supercar, hypercar. Mm. It's a tuning of the systems, not only the exhaust, but there's a few other things that can change the sound of the engine. But basically what they tried to do is give the car a sound that in some cases gives you goosebumps, in other cases calms you. It's like a voice on a person, mm. very much like that. What worries me a little bit is that we're getting into the age nowadays of the electronic vehicles where voice becomes sort of less important than it was before. And, you know, if you ask a lot of owners of cars that are very passionate, they'll describe the, the sound of their car almost as if it's, you know, they're in love with the sound of the voice mm. of their partner or something, that kind of emotion in, in, in that one specific area. I find it quite interesting. But again, I think in the electronic age, now that we're sort of losing that type of sound, it's going to be very important for engineers to develop a new sound for cars and other vehicles that is just as emotional as the sound we have today from internal combustion engines, ICE, and develop a sound that is pleasant electronically. Because you need to know that cars are approaching. You need to, you know, it's mm -hmm. just an awareness thing mm -hmm. also from a safety point of view. But also from an emotional point of view, if you took the voice away from somebody, they're losing the quality mm -hmm. that you, know, you can't appreciate if, if it was there. After that phase is done, then you enter your first prototype phases where the actual car is being built and people are getting used to building it on the production line. What comes into play there are tolerances that gaps and panels are all meeting properly and the quality is in the build. After that, you have your launch where the car is introduced to the world. It's kind of like bringing the baby to market. <laughs> it's, it's a big, long process that uh, completes it from that initial spark you had in your brain to actually seeing it being driven around on the streets of wherever you're at. So your first experience with the manufacturer was with Ford. Yeah, I have to be very thankful for that period of my life, the first years of my professional design life with Ford, simply because they had so many ways to teach a designer. Ford was almost the perfect training ground to bring you into the world of design because they had a huge variety of cars and they had a huge design team. I was located in or based in Cologne, West Germany at the time, mid to late 80s. It was a very international design team, and it still felt like a family, you know, even though we were mostly all from different countries. So I was able to be introduced into this team where you learned a very international flavor of design. Fords are seen as world cars. They're sold all over the world, and so when you design a car... For Ford, you're pretty much designing a car for all markets of the mm -hmm. world. So you're not hemmed in or, or, or steered in a direction that means that a smaller amount of people are going to want to buy your car, purchase mm -hmm. that design. You're spreading out your peripheral vision and design is pretty wide when you design for Ford. And they have the resources to allow you to, as a designer, to try everything. You know, you Great. can go from designing on paper to using all kinds of computer-aided equipment, and you're working with professionals that are so good at what they do and many different teams and many different projects. So that initial exposure, I guess you could say, to the world of professional design was, was awesome at Ford. After five years with Ford, I had uh, I'd grown a little bit, and I was becoming a bit more confident in, in my design technique and what I'd done, that I wanted to move on to a bit of a more exclusive type of design language. And in Germany, they have quite a few design houses, and there are other opportunities I could reach out to. BMW? Yeah. Yeah, I moved down south from Cologne down to Munich, uh, one of the definitely one of the more beautiful areas in Europe. BMW for me in that stage in the early 90s, it was a perfect step up from what I had been doing because they were pretty much still a relatively small range company. They were only producing then the 3 Series, the 5 Series, and the 7 Series BMW. So say an entry level, a mid range, and a luxury range of cars. And it gave me the opportunity to get straight into there and you know the reputation of the company is very good. And they did wonderfully respected automobiles since many, many years. And it felt like a good step up mm. and still very small in a certain respect in terms of volume compared to Ford and other manufacturers. But it was a, it was a good choice, I think. You worked with them to design BMW's SUV. Mm -hmm. five, that didn't exist that. when I started because, like I said, they only had three mm. ranges of cars. But it was another right place, right time moment because they had just bought Land Rover. 
and they'd acquired MG with that, Rover Cars, they'd acquired uh, Mini, they'd acquired Wolseley, which is an obscure English mm -hmm. brand nowadays. They decided in 94, let's see what a BMW SUV could look like if we base it off the Land Rover platform. Oh, yeah. In other words, a Land Rover base with yeah. a BMW body on it, so Got to it. speak. I was given that challenge, and it was interesting because I had very little time to do it. Typically, you know, you have six weeks, you know, mm -hmm. six months maybe to do a sketch program. I pretty much had a weekend to, to turn an idea into a sketch on the flight going south to mm -hmm. Turin from Munich to spend the next six weeks at a, a design house in Italy that would work 18 hours a day, seven days a week, to turn this idea into a physical mm -hmm. model. So you find that kind of level of pressure to think quickly sometimes mm. enhances what you output. Absolutely. But at the same time, I don't refer to it. I would never refer to something like this as stress. Mm. Mm. Uh, but the the stress is not stress. The stress is just do it faster, yeah. you know, sleep yeah. faster, that kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> <laughs> the big boss at BMW wanted to see an SUV BMW in six weeks, and the design director at the time at BMW thought it would be a six-week sketch program, but the uh, man who was requesting it said, no, I want to see a full-size oh. <laughs> model of the car. I don't want to wait six weeks for a sketch. I want to see what it could look like in six weeks. So it was impossible during those days, the mid-'90s in Germany, to work on the weekends because the mm -hmm. union laws prohibited it. And the only way to do it was to go out of house. And in Turin, Italy, they have a few design houses that will... Mm -hmm build your design and they'll work crazy hours and, and deliver crazy quality, amazing mm -hmm. quality. They sent me basically down to this place a couple of days after I was told I was going and wondering where the design was coming from. And, they, and the design boss says, well, you'll have a few hours on the plane to, to get the design done. I remember landing in Turin on a Sunday afternoon, getting picked up by the translator and immediately being driven out to the industrial estate where this shop was, where they were going to build it. And he opens the door, and behind the door are standing three older gentlemen, no less than 70 years old, each one of them. First reaction was complete shock. I immediately questioned it to the translator, saying, are these three older gentlemen going to be able to mm -hmm. hold up for six weeks? You know, it's 18 hours a day, seven days a week work yeah. schedule. And they looked pretty tired just standing there with their <laughs> Italian cigarettes and espresso. And he says, oh, don't you worry about these three guys. They're the same three guys that built the Lamborghini Mura <laughs> in the late 60s, which is one of the beautiful. most beautiful cars ever. Yeah. They'd done it in their 20s and they you know, continued to work together as a mm -hmm. team. But basically, I was standing in front of Michelangelo... Rembrandt and um, <laughs> Raphael or something, Da Vinci, awesome. And then the next vehicle was the Mini, which is an interesting one for me because it's the reinterpretation. For such an iconic car, that must have been a really interesting challenge. I typically like to refer to it as playing with fire at that stage because the Mini is such an icon. Anytime you try to reinterpret an icon, you're going to be stepping on somebody's toes who, who won't like it. So it's a very difficult juggle to balance a design that is so loved with something that you're trying to bring out that sort of not only is reminiscent of the original one, but that takes it, you know, further into the future. So BMW had this huge decision on their hands of whether just to let the original Mini die out because the legislation would say, okay, the card now for today's uh, standard is too dangerous. Or do we try to reinvent the brand or reinterpret the brand or do something to continue Mini as a, as a company? And they decided to do that, but then they also realized that if they got it wrong, that you know, the Germans <laughs> grabbed a British <laughs> icon and made a mess of it, <laughs> yeah. you know, they destroyed it. So like I said earlier, it's typical that you would take three designs forward to evaluate. Well, BMW didn't think that would be enough to make the right choice, so it's only happened this one time in history and probably never again. But what they decided was to do 15 different models mm -hmm. to choose from. Huge budget, I mean... You know, three cars is, is crazy expensive to to develop the three cars to a point where you can choose one of those three. To do 15 is unheard of, and, and uh, that's why I say it probably will never mm. be done again. Mm. I think it almost broke the bank for it. <laughs> um, at any rate, what they did was ask 15 designers around the world to do their 21st century interpretation of what the new Mini could look like, and that would lead down to a showdown uh, that happened in October of '95 where basically at the Gaydon Heritage Center, just south of Coventry, uh, they would put out on display for the 
seven BMW execs and the seven Rover execs to choose one of those 15 models as the new Mini to go forward mm. with for the next five years in development. I was one of those 15 designers, and uh, and you could do what you thought. So we had designers going from one extreme to the other extreme. It was an amazing show to see those 15 full-size Minis mm. five years before production, uh, what the new Mini could look like. Mm. And we had... Um, you know, from one extreme where the designers looked like they'd been asleep and just <laughs> scaled the mini up yeah. to the other extreme where he mm. was smoking something for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and basically mine was middle of the road, but it was a logical interpretation, mm. I would say, of the mm. mini, how it would have evolved mm. if it had evolved. Mm. The mini had basically stayed the same shape for 40 years. It was mm. born in 59 and it was going to die in 99. Mm. So... If it had evolved in shape every 10 years, what could that 10-year step look like? So I designed the 69 Mini, which never existed, mm -hmm. the first week, and then successively the 79 the second, and 89 the third week, and then the 99 the last week. But what I did was when I did those individual design exercises for each decade was try to take into account society at that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we moved through the 60s, things got a little bit more colorful mm -hmm. and happy and... You know, so that reflected back in that design. And then in the 70s, we were so concerned about safety. And so the, the, the Mini for 79 was not the most beautiful one. Mm -hmm. uh, boxy, very safe, very sturdy and everything. Then in the 80s, we started to go for a bit more sporty styles, a little bit like that, and a little bit more fun in small cars. And so I did that for the 80s. And then from the 90s, it was all about basically trying to satisfy the emotional appeal mm -hmm. of a car for people. Because by that time, cars, all cars were good. Mm -hmm. You don't buy a car and it breaks down very easily yeah. in the 90s. You're obviously selling quality, so the big difference is design. Mm -hmm. So I capitalized on trying to make the car look really unique, real, full of character, still carrying that emotion of the past, of the original Mini, but using a lot of future technology such that when the car came out or when the car basically was in its engineering phase, a lot of the engineers says we said we couldn't, there's no way we can make this car work. The design is too futuristic, <laughs> and you don't see it, obviously, unless I point it out to you. But there are elements in the car that were absolutely impossible at the time to produce. Mm. And so when the car came out and there was a little bit of, oh, it's a retro design, I really, it makes my blood boil because the car is not retro. It's basically a futuristic Mini mm. <laughs> in a certain mm. way. The Mini was quite successful and there were a lot of tempting offers to go away and work for other companies at the time after the Mini came out. With Ferrari, it was a little bit different. I had no idea that it was them. They I just had received a phone call and saying, would you be interested in a high-level position with a, a great car company? And, and, of course, you can't turn that down, but they wouldn't say who they were. So I received a plane ticket to fly down to Turin to meet people representing the company. And I was immediately put off because I thought, this has to be Fiat. You know, Turin equals Fiat. Mm. Fiat equals Turin. It's, the, mm. it's Fiat town. And so I wasn't really hyped up about it. So at the end of the lunch meeting I had with these people from Fiat, they said, well, we are actually representing Ferrari and Maserati, and what we'd like to offer you is the design director position for Ferrari and Maserati. And my first reaction was you know, disbelief because Ferrari had never had a design director or or neither did Maserati. They used Pininfarina and Giugiaro as their design houses. The offer was too good to believe. It was almost, you know, how can you say no to mm. being design director for two companies like that? And if the Pope asks you to come to Rome, you don't <laughs> yeah. debate it, you just go. <laughs> so I ended up going straight down to Italy from Germany and working with Ferrari and Maserati for the next almost six years, mm. yeah. How would you describe working there in particular? Because you know, these guys... Ferrari and Maserati a very unique language. Yeah. Was it challenging for you to move away or try and push forward that language? Yeah, it was incredibly different from working in a German culture. And the Germans are very strict in terms of timing and, and schedules and everything has to be done to the letter mm -hmm. kind of approach, whereas the Italians are so flexible. It was, uh, it was radical. If the meeting was happening at 3 o'clock, my first experience is I'd be there you know, shortly before 3 at 3.20, I start realizing somebody's forgotten about a meeting. <laughs> Nobody's coming. And then, you know, everybody, oh, yeah, that meeting, well, we'll have it next week. So <laughs> wow. you have to be very flexible in your working style in, in Italy. It's not that it's a bad system or that it doesn't work. It absolutely does work. It's just a completely different mental approach. In Germany, if it happened that way, the system would crack, mm. you know, and you wouldn't get anywhere. But with the Italian way of thinking, everything is 
is doable. It's just, you know, you just bend the rules a little mm. bit. So it was fun. I mean, mm. I have to say, working in, in Ferrari and Maserati, designing cars for them was just about, you know, it's the next closest thing to heaven and sort of having the kind of fun you would have in hell at the same time, you know, because it was all over the place. But the results were fantastic, and you have this whole backing of people who just will buy anything you design at Ferrari. What was the brief for the F430? To make it look prettier than the 360, the one that we seated it. So the 360 was basically a a very admired uh, supercar from Ferrari. And the 430, the brief was take the same platform and build a much more beautiful car. It's going to have a bit more horsepower and everything, but nothing underneath the skeleton is going to move. But, of course, the challenges are to make it more aerodynamic, lighter, prettier. The first thing is how do you make something prettier than than something that's already considered iconically pretty almost. But you do it. Just sort of put it out of your head that that car exists. It wasn't sort of to take the DNA of that 360, of that predecessor design, and advance it. It was basically take it off and do something else. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you're trying to, like with a Mini, to to give it that emotional appeal of the original Mini, that's very difficult Mm -hmm. because how much do you give it and what Mm -hmm. do you give it and all that. Whereas designing a 430 from a clean sheet of paper, mm. almost, a- mm. aesthetically. Mm. You either get it right or you get it wrong, mm. obviously, but um, well, it was a good challenge. Moving from Ferrari, you went to Fiat. Yeah, one moment you're, you're in heaven, the next moment you really are in hell. <laughs> uh, 2006, Fiat was pretty much in the doldrums. They weren't really selling too much, and uh, actually they were, they were very, it was a very touch-and-go situation. So I received a call from the president of Ferrari, Luca Cordero di Montesemolo. And he said, Frank, how you doing? I go, well, you know, touch and go with this man flu. I don't know if I'm going to make it. <laughs> Men understand what I'm saying. Uh, women will never understand. <laughs> Deadly. <laughs> um, so he said, well, have a glass of champagne because on Monday you're going to be going to Fiat. My first reaction was, what, I, what have I done wrong? You know, what kind of punishment is this? And he said, well, no, we have a new boss coming in uh, at Fiat, and they're really doing, they're not doing too well. And I want to speak to you on Monday about future strategy. So I went to Fiat headquarters on the Monday and spoke with him, and he said, look, I don't know too much about cars, but I know a lot about finances. If we don't have a great new product on the road in 10 months, we're sinking, we're out of here. And uh, I said, well, great, but 10 months is a bit Mm. quick to develop a a car, much less a successful car that can save a company, you know. I said, well, that's your job. So I remember going back that evening to the hotel and just crying, (laughs) a grown man crying, thinking, you know, there's no way you can take on a design project, do a car that's successful, have it on the road in 10 months. It's unheard of. But we hit it on the head when we finally realized that basically we don't really have to design a new car. We can just take an existing car, which was the Fiat Panda. It was the only car really trickling out of the factory. And if we just take the panels off of it and put some new panels on it, we can actually reinvent the Fiat 500. So what we did was take this iconic car from the 50s in in Italy, the Cinquecento, which pretty much put families on wheels. Mm. north to south people started going down visiting their relatives finally (laughs) in Naples but what we could do is carry that flavor that sort of reinterpretation of how we did the mini into the Italian Mm -hmm. culture with the Fiat 500 and it worked pretty much just uh, redressed the um, the the panda into something that was very close to what a Fiat 500 today would look like Mm -hmm. And bam, right off the bat, I mean, we didn't have to do any testing, mm-hmm. re-homologating, mm-hmm. cold weather, hot weather testing, crash testing, none of that. The car was basically just a same car with different look on it. And the car just took off as the fashion car for a lot of capitals around the world. You know, it wasn't considered a chick's car or a guy's car. It was pretty much right down the middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could get the mm-hmm. pocket rocket version with the Abarth. That was a peppy little Dennis the Menace kind of you know, <laughs> aggressive little thing. And then it became very accessorizable. You could have your own Fiat mm-hmm. 500, no two of them looking the same. And yeah, it just took off and pretty much pulled Fiat back to <laughs> the land of the living. <laughs> yeah. Is there one specific car that's given you particular satisfaction and one that you're most proud of? Uh, satisfaction is difficult in the world of design because we're very unsatisfied people. Mm. We're never satisfied. And that's what basically drives us to always keep going. But the one I've enjoyed the most working on was a, a pretty rare car because only 25 of them were going to be built. And it turned out that we ended up building 50 of them, so doubled the amount. But it was a car that brought Maserati back to the world of sports cars, racing and things. They had 
decided in the early 2000s that they wanted to return. And the way to do that was, as Ferrari competes in Formula One, Maserati would compete rather in something called the FIA GT type races, which are like Le Mans endurance type racing. So what they had to do to be able to compete was you had to have a minimum of 25 road cars of that race car sold to Mm -hmm. the public. Because you couldn't just build an all-in-out race car. You had to do something that was sort of derived from a road car. So Maserati didn't have this road car. So what they decided to do was build this race car, come in from the back door. Let's build a race car and turn it into a road yep. car because we want to win this championship. <laughs> We're not going to compromise the race car because of what the road car looks like, which is what everybody else was doing. Turn a Porsche into mm. a race car, turn an Aston Martin into a race car. And then Maserati had this brilliant idea, let's take a race car and turn it into a road (laughs) car. So the car was obviously very, very successful. And I enjoyed it because I worked with a race car company to develop, design and develop the race car, Dallara, just Mm -hmm. outside of Parma in Italy. Then I had to take that race car and drive it into a road car, so it had to be street legal. Mm -hmm. And that was fun too, obviously. When you see that car on the road, you never forget it. It has so much presence. It's, It's really like seeing a... You know, a race car on the roads kind of thing, <laughs> even though it is road legal. <laughs> that was cool. And that was only part one. Download or listen to part two of this episode, where we talk about the future of transport, nature and design, and the holy grail, perfection. See you on the other side.